Hi, my name is Carl. Marjorie, thank you so much for inviting me down to speak, uh, or up to speak. Uh, I consider this a great privilege, and I tell you something like this, I can't tell you how valuable it is to me, and I hope it's of some value to you. If anyone gets called out uh, during this, I have a three-minute version, which I'd like to give you so you'll get the picture. <laughs> uh, it's an analogy, and as you know, analogies are never perfect, but this one's pretty good. Uh, before program, I was very much like the family dog. <laughs> Absolutely important member of the family and lovable as can be, and do anything you wanted to do. I could run errands, I could fetch, I could guard you. Uh, you know, dogs can be detectives, we can sniff things out. We're rescuers, we rescue people in the snow in the Swiss Alps. We have convenient little kegs of brandy around our throats <laughs> to enable some people. And dogs, of course, need to be taken care of a little bit, and we have to be taken out for walks and a good run. And if you're not ready to do that, that's okay. We can wait and wait and wait and wait. And when you're finally ready, we're so grateful, so grateful. <laughs> but that was before program. Now, nearly 23 years later, I am much more like the family cat. I'm just as lovable and just as important member of the family as that damn dog. <laughs> and I love you and you love me. I share my life with you and you share your life with me. But you are not my life. I have a life. <laughs> I won't do everything you want me to do. But I'll do a lot of things that I want to do. And if you're in trouble, I can't rescue you, but I'll listen to you, and I'll make you feel better just by listening. And I'll jump into your lap and make you feel good, and I'll put my arms around you, and I'll tell you I love you, and I'll purr, and you'll feel better. But don't ask me to do that when I'm napping. <laughs> you wait until I get up. <laughs> and then I probably am hungry, and I have to go have a bite to eat, so you just wait a little bit. Yeah. And after that, you know, I have a drink and I have to wash up, you know. That's what we do. And if it's near 3 o'clock, you know, I go out the back door and I have to inspect the backyards. I've got work to do out there. They're expecting me. i got mice to chase and i got birds to scare. And there's a nasty dog about four houses down. I give him obedience lessons every day. <laughs> and when I come back, maybe your problem will be all solved and we won't even have to bother with it. <laughs> But if we do, I'll jump into your lap and I'll throw it. I'll put my arms around you and I'll hug you. Well, that's the end of the, end of the analogy, meow. <laughs> and now for the longer version. About 20 years ago, I was stopped for speeding somewhere in Alabama, and I was sitting in the front seat with a cop, and he was writing up my ticket, and he said to me, you know how fast you were going? I said, yeah, about 85. And he said, well, the radar said 83. I said, okay, fair enough. And he said, we never stop people here unless they're going over 79. I said, you know, I really wish I had known that, you know. <laughs> and then he said, uh, so why were you going so fast? I said, because I thought I could get away with it. <laughs> and this guy froze. He said, uh, and nobody's ever said that to me before. <laughs> ever. He said, if I could tear up this ticket, I would. He, I, I, can't. I said, it's just my luck, but that's okay. And he said, so what makes you so honest? And I said, and I thought for a minute, and I said, you know, I've been in a program called Al-Anon for about two years, and I'm pretty sure that's where it comes from. He said, what is that, Al-Anon? So I gave him, a, said a little something, and he had another question, and I said a little more. Another question, some more, more. I spent 20 minutes talking to this cop about Al-Anon and AA. The 20 minutes I had saved speeding, I gave it all back to the cop. <laughs> And I knew that he was not asking those questions out of idle curiosity. And he wasn't asking for his cousin. It was for him. And he knew that I knew. And I knew that he knew that I knew. And well, we never said anything. We're still doing John Wayne, you know. <laughs> and we got finished finally. And he handed me the ticket to sign off on. And I started to. And I said, my gosh, you got me down here for 61 miles an hour. I, he said, yeah. He said, and it's the reason for that is you see the traffic lines here are just incredibly steep. And he said, would it cost you about 360 bucks? And he says, this way, it's still going to cost you 90. He says, that's the best I could do. And I said, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And he said, thank you. 
I got into my car. He waited until I got started. He did a big U-turn, waved to me from across the street, blew his horn. It was like we were old friends, and I waved back and blew my horn like we were old friends. And I got back on the road and continued on my way to my destination, which uh, was New Orleans. Doing 79 miles an hour. <laughs> And I was feeling great. I was feeling absolutely fabulous. And why? Why? Because I've been working the steps, the principles of this program. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Took responsibility for my own actions. Carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And also, I saved 270 bucks. <laughs> and before program, uh-uh. I would have been angry as hell. I'd have been screaming up there and say, where was that cop when all those people were passing me? I was doing 85 and they were doing 95 and 105. Where was that cop? What are you picking on me for for $360? I'd have been going on and on like that. I would have been bent out of shape and angry as hell. But the program takes my bad decision to be, you know, to speed and turns it into something worthwhile. Some good comes out of this. I even get to feel good about myself. <clears throat> and it starts out, you see, this program, it, it does what the alchemists could not do in the Middle Ages. It takes lead and turns it into gold. It takes my bad behavior and turns it into some good comes out of it. I like to think that there's a cop somewhere in Alabama who's sitting at an Allen on me and saying, you know, it's funny how I got you. Gave a guy a ticket once. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, it's not unlikely. Not at all. Now, about in the 90s, uh, a woman in Allen on asked, said something to me, and I immediately relapsed as if I had never been to a meeting before in my life. She said, Carl, I have a situation at work, and you are the solution. Uh, 911, this is Carl. How may I help? <laughs> oh, what was wrong with me? I don't know. But a quick check of my college background and my credits and a quick exam, and I was suddenly a counselor in anger management. Hello. <clears throat> with absolutely no experience. And I was going to work for this lady. I was going to work with men who had been convicted of domestic violence. And instead of going to jail, they came to anger management once a week for an hour and a half for 52 weeks, and they paid for it, and they didn't want to be there. Well, later on they did, but they didn't want to when they started out. And they got it wiped off their records. These were not the worst cases. The worst cases went to jail. But uh, the woman said to me, we got a lot of newcomers here. You know, with newcomers, you know, they're in denial. It's not their fault. It was the wife's fault or the girlfriend's fault and all that. And we've got to get them over that denial. And they need a man as a counselor. This lady has left, and I decided they need a man. You're the guy. And she got me so enthusiastic about this. I, well, you know what al Anons are like. If anything is worth doing, it's worth doing to perfection. The alcoholic, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing to excess. <laughs> But if you think about a human being and perfection, you know, perfection is a little excessive. And so really the other side of the coin of the alcoholic, I mean, we're crazy too without drinking. But I was going to be the greatest counselor and management that Southern California had ever seen. Why one day there'd be a little statue, perhaps a modest statue up in Sacramento. You know. <laughs> he wiped out, you know. And that was a week before, but two days before, the woman got together with me and she gave me the case histories. And I looked at them and I thought, how can I talk to these guys? They're all so different. They uh, range in age from 19 to 70. They were all walks of life. You name the race, that was it. National ethnic background, so different. Here I am, Waspy. How am I going to talk to some of these Latino guys? How am I going to talk to a day laborer? I had a college professor there. I had guys with two strikes on him. And I was starting to get worried. And Because, uh, you know, that first encounter, when you meet them, if you don't connect with them, nothing happens. You may lose them. And it's important to get through to them because domestic violence, once it starts, doesn't go away by itself. And then she added, and she says, oh, there's one guy there not for domestic violence. Oh, great. His parole officer wants him to go to anger management. I said, parole officer, what do you do? Well, he was in prison for 13 years. I said, in prison for 13 years, what did he do? She said, well, you know, uh, grievous bodily harm, manslaughter, and a violent temper. And I said, I'm going to have to talk to these people. I'm going to have to make a connection with these. I'm going to you know, help them. I've never done this before in my life. And I thought to myself, this is another fine mess you've got me into, Stanley. And as we know in Alan on, we are our own Stanleys. And I didn't want to go through with it, but I had to. What was I going to say to these guys on that first time around? I didn't know. But you know what? I have a higher power, and I call him God. I don't know if he's God or not. But I just use the word God. That's it. I talk to him. I pray twice a day. Thank you in the morning. Thank you at night. And when I have a problem, I trot it out, and I meditate, and I say, here's the problem. I need help. What am I going to do? What am I going to say to these guys? And then it's like magic. 
It's as if I'm taken by the hand and I'm led up the mountain and there's the guru. And I say the problem again and this guy looks at me and he says, you silly man. You know what to tell them. It's in your program. Oh, yeah. And I knew. And I couldn't wait. And it was a rainy, cold night and I got over to this claustrophobic little room for this critical first encounter. Windowless, terrible room. Twenty guys. And they were waiting for me. Boy, were they waiting. And here's what I hit them with. I said, my wife and I have been together for nearly 40 years, and we have a great marriage. We get along beautifully. We don't fight. We don't argue. We don't raise our voices to each other. We don't tease each other. We get along beautifully. We, like, we love each other. We respect and admire each other. We even like each other. And what's interesting is my wife uh, is an alcoholic. Hello. But she hasn't had a drink since 1981. And back in the days when she did drink, she didn't drink all the time. She's what we call a periodic. Sometimes she wouldn't drink for a year, six months, six weeks. Life was good. Marriage was great. Better now. Now everything is great. Really everything. When I say everything, gentlemen, I'm talking about everything. <laughs> <laughs> but then when she did drink, you know, it wasn't always so hot. And I never knew which Sarah I was going to get. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes not. She had beyond a certain amount, she went into blackout. I didn't know that at the time. But way back 40 years ago, we came home from a party in Hollywood. We were trying to make some connections for our careers. And she didn't behave too well. I mean, she didn't say this, but it, it, she was very funny. It was very funny. But you do not say to a producer's wife, you know, that ladies who wear moo-moos look like cow-cows. <laughs> I mean, this is funny, but it's, you don't say it to the producer's wife, you know, who might uh, have a shot at maybe getting a job from him. No. So I was kind of, you know, just a little bit angry when we got home, just a little bit. And fortunately, she went into bed, and I just put on some music, had a glass of wine to calm down. She came back into the room, and she starts in on me as if I had done something wrong. I hadn't done anything wrong. I didn't know she was in black. Huh? She read the riot act to me, accused me of things that were completely untrue, pushed every button I had, drove me up the wall, wouldn't listen to me. I yelled at her, screaming, stop, you. what the hell are you talking about? And I couldn't get her attention. And I picked up a chair and threw it across the room. It didn't, she didn't phase her. She didn't even notice it. And then I walked across the room and I gave her a backhand across the face. And then she stopped. And that was the first time in my life that I'd ever hit another human being except in self-defense. And except as a kid, that was maybe once. And I swore that would never happen again. She didn't know what happened. She had a red mark on her face the next day. And I told her what happened and I apologized. She didn't know what she'd said. I swore it would never happen again. So six months later, when it happened again, I realized that once the animal is out of the cage, it's hard to get it back inside. And I said, this better never happen again, but it happened again. And that was it for me. And I went off and I found a counselor. It turned out to be a psychiatrist. You know what, guys? He cured me in one session. Never hit my wife again. She never had to worry about it ever again. Cured. One session. Beautiful. I told him what happened. I told him about all the buttons he, she pushed. Why I lost it. This, that, and the other thing. He said, yeah, pretty tough, pretty bad. Yeah. He says, well, I'll work with you. He said, I'll give you two alternatives. What do you want to be, a bully or a real man? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you lost it with your wife. You're bigger and stronger than she is. Way down deep, you know that if you lose it, you'll get away with it. He said, but if I bring in a guy here next week who's seven feet four and 350 pounds, and he wraps a hand around your throat, and he could throw you against the wall and break you in half, I get him to push all your buttons and get you to the point where you were just going twice as mad as Sarah ever made you, at what point are you going to lose it and all off and hit him? I said, I get the picture. And from that point on, my wife never had to worry about me hitting her again because he said, real man or bully? I said, real man. Now, I got just as angry again in the future, many times. But this guy showed me how not to act it out, what to do with it. That little thought experiment was right there. I didn't want to be a bully. And every man in this room has at one time or another in his life been a bully. And that's good news for you guys because it means I know what I'm talking about. And that's good news for you guys twice, because it means I know what you are talking about. So you want to work with me? Let's work together. And if you don't, shh. And we started to work together. Within a month, I had four guys in Al-Anon. 
the group was cooperating. They were working beautifully. One guy was a holdout. He was from a foreign culture, I won't name it, where wife beating and child beating was a national sport. And he didn't want to understand that. The group got on his case and said, you don't live there anymore. You're an American now. And even he started to come around. And that ex-convict finished up his year. Yeah, I had him for three months. He did his exit exam. He graduated. He came back to me and he said, Carl, thank you. I've never listened to another man before in my life. My old man, my uncle, were drunks. The parish, the priest in the church was sleeping with half the women in the parish. And who wanted to listen to them? He said, but you came in that first night and you blew me away. He said, you blew all of us away. We were talking about it when you left. And he said, I've listened. And he said, I'm responsible for what I did. And for what I do, I don't ever have to do it again. Thank you for giving me my life. And he walked away. I went into my office and I sobbed. Me? Me turn a guy's life around? Me help these guys become real men? No, it wasn't me. Oh, it was this program. It was these steps. I shared part of my fifth step with these men. That's all I did. One drunk talks to another. One Halloween talks to another. One domestic violence talks to another. I learned that in this program. If I hadn't done a fourth step, I never would have had a fifth step. If my sponsor hadn't made me put my name on the list and forgive myself for that behavior years earlier, he said, you can't hold yourself hostage for that. You can't go back and change your past. But he said, but you had the guts to change your future. Give yourself credit and let go of it, for God's sake. And I did. And that meant I had no secrets. If we were as sick as our secrets, I didn't have any secrets from these guys or from you or from anybody. And that's the magic of the program, once again. Out of my rotten behavior, 40 years earlier, I get to feel terrific about myself. This program takes that rotten behavior and turns it into something worthwhile. Lead into gold, the magic of the program. It says somewhere in the big book, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, our experience can be of help and benefit to others. And so it was. That, those are my miracles, and I've got more. My first meeting, they were talking about the steps, and I didn't want to, if I would have heard a guy talking about this stuff, I said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. What's it got to do with living in a drunk for 25 years? You know, because I couldn't make the connection early on. My wife stopped drinking, but she escalated into pills, and at one point she, uh, at the urging of a psychologist, who said she would treat her if she got uh, rid of all the medication she was taking. And for six years, I was in the dark again, in denial, and getting screwed as usual, not knowing what was going on. But at least she didn't fall down for six years. That was okay. And when she was on speed, man, could she do housework? Unbelievable. <laughs> and so she uh, went into a detox for 28 days, and I took her to check in, to, for, in the, at the administration uh, desk. And uh, I must say that on the outside, I was serene and helpful and supportive. And way down deep, there was something gnawing away. I identify it now as saying, why is it always about her? What the hell is this? First, you know, she's a drunk, and now she's a pill head. And, you know, when is it my turn? I've been a good guy all my life. I did what my parents said. I obey the Lord. And all this crap goes on. That's all down there. So you might say that I was a little bit angry. <laughs> but on the outside, I was cool, cool Carl, you know. And she's walking down the hall, and they're tottering to 28-day lockdown. And the admissions are said, will you help her? And I said, sure. She said, here, this is for you for 28 days. And there were uh, seminars and things to go to. And I said, I'll go to them. Yeah, fine, all of that stuff. And there's a case psychologist. I said, fine, she'll need it. And she said, no, no, it's for you too. And I said, that's all right. That's fine. And she said, of course, you'll go to Al-Anon. And I said, what is that? And she said, oh, that's for your disease, honey. <laughs> Oh, I was already feeling so terrific anyway. The, the conversation after that can only be described as brief and, and spirited. So I backed, I got into the elevator and I turned around as the doors were sliding shut. She said, go down at the basement and turn left. There's an Al-Anon meeting in progress. And as the doors were sliding shut, I wanted to give her the Sicilian sign and she missed it. And that made me angry. So the buttons are sticking out on the elevator. So I gave the first floor button a big healthy left jab. And the doors, and the elevator went down, and the doors opened up, and it was in the basement. What are you doing to me? I said, okay, I'm here. And I walked past, turned left, walked past the morgue, and it is meeting in progress. And it was a packed house, 
fortunately, and there's one seat way in the back, so I had to go through in front of all the people. And, go, oh. and fortunately, this meeting was coming to an end because the first thing I heard drove me wild. Hi, my name is Rebecca Sunnybrook Farm. And... <laughs> Oh, I made amends to my alcoholic. It was so beautiful that day, and we've been so happy. So, wow. <laughs> and I listened to some more of his drivel, and I wanted to get out there, but I didn't want to go in front of all those people again. You know, so I waited and waited. And finally, we got to the, to the closing. And, uh, hi, I, I'm your leader, Goody Two Shoes. And... She reads the Alan on closing, and she gets to the part, for all those who know it, she says, and for the newcomer, uh, we, aren't, uh, we aren't perfect. I say, yeah, you got that right. <laughs> and though you may not like all of us, uh-huh, you all come to love us in a very special way, in the same way we already love you. <laughs> So we, so we stood up and we, we said the serenity prayer, and I tried to get out, and it was a hammerlock from the left and a, and a half Nelson from the, from, from, from the right. You know, it, it, you, you know this, this is the Al Anon hug. Don't let the newcomer escape. <laughs> and especially a guy, you know. And I said, no, 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 no I don't need any help. You know, and my wife doesn't drink anymore. She's up there, no more pills. She said, here's a newcomer. I don't need, I don't think they keep coming back, keep coming back. <laughs> I went home for lack of anything to do that night, staring at the cat. <laughs> she made me feel guilty. I don't know. I read Understanding Ourselves. They might have just said, Dear Carl, and they put my life history right there. You know, I felt responsible for her alcoholism. I got angry at her alcoholism. I blamed myself. You know, I counted the drinks. I did this. I did that. I did all, all the wrong things for the right reason. I loved her. But I messed things up, and I made it all worse, and I thought, Hey, I better stop doing this. I can't keep doing this. First day. I'm like the drunk who was told that you can't drink anymore because if you do, you're going to die in six months. And he says, okay, I quit. They're pretty rare. But I'm the Alan Ryan counterpart. Now, I didn't get into the steps or anything like that, but I got out of her face. I was, actually, it was in step one. When it says we're powerless over alcohol, it translates to this Alan on as mind your own business, stay out of her face. And I did. I started it from day one, and it changed our relationship. And it got better and better the more, and I stayed out of her face. You see, what alcohol brings out the worst in the alcoholic and the worst in the people around them. And when you have an alcohol, you're living with an alcoholic, and when they're drinking, they behave like a two-year-old brat. Now, if I had control issues, they really came out when she was behaving like a two-year-old brat because that turned me into an angry parent, and I wanted to stop this nasty, stupid behavior. And now I had control issues because I controlled everything about her. You know, you become like that. And uh, so I was working on not being in control. And I said to her one day, I'm working on not being in control. I don't know always when I do it. Would you be willing to tell me when I do it to you? And she said, oh, would I? <laughs> and, you know, the first thing she said to me, we had one car at the time. She said, we go to drive with this. The two of us, you always drive. Why is that? I said, I don't know. I guess because I'm in control. You know? She said, yeah. She says, I get to drive too. I said, okay. And so I learned to become a passenger while my wife was driving. <laughs> and Sarah drives differently. <laughs> to be honest, she drives well, but she doesn't drive the way I do. You see, it's my problem. And I sit there as a passenger, you know, putting the brakes on when she wasn't and making the red light when she wouldn't. And, you know, it was my problem. I had to stop. And I had to look out the window and bite my tongue until it was bloody, bloody. And the other thing is, when the person is driving, we don't tell them where to go or how to go. They're in charge. I go to the airport from my house. I know exactly how to go. Zip, zip. I'm at LAX in no time, even with traffic. We, she drove us one day, and I thought we were going to Catalina Island. <laughs> and so I'm looking out the window. I don't want her to see the blood coming out of my tongue. <laughs> and finally... I relaxed, and I started to enjoy the ride. And going through some section of uh, Westwood or L.A., I spotted a little, turned out to be a little gem of a French restaurant, way stuck somewhere, never would have found it if we hadn't been going to the airport Sarah's way. And I learned the lesson that day that my way is not the only way. Not only how to get to the airport, there's more than one way to do that, but in all kinds of things. And I never looked back. Our marriage was just 
going great. I wouldn't tell her what to do for anything. She knows how to cross the street and look both ways without me telling her. I don't even tell her how to. It's raining. Drive carefully. No. For me, that's an Al-Anon slip. Oh, you're going too far, said a lady one day. She says, I tell my husband to do that because I love him. I said, when I want to tell my wife I love her, I have ways of doing it. It's not to tell her what to do. I give her a big smoochie before she goes out the door, and she'll want to come back for more. And boy, she'll drive carefully to get some more. <laughs> so about six months into the program, I'm ready to leave. My Al-Anon condition is what I call it, was hammered into submission, and our marriage was great. And if we had continued that way, it would have been fine. Millions and millions of marriages would love to have what we had, even with that. But I happened to bump into the psychologist on occasion, and uh, she had me into a room, and we chatted a little bit, and funny things happened. Uh, you know, it turned out my childhood was a little dysfunctional. I hadn't realized that. Uh, <laughs> is there anyone here who comes from a non-dysfunctional family? Uh, if so, would you kindly leave the room? I thought my childhood was normal as anybody else's, but the, I don't want to belabor it, but the critical part was between the ages of five and about 12, and my mother, as it turns out, was an untreated Al-Anon. Uh, her, her father was a raging alcoholic, and uh, my dad grew up with three sisters and his mother. His dad died when, he, when my dad was about three, and he deferred to, to my mother. And she, this rager, uh, between in those ages, I don't know what, what happened, what it was, but I was loved, I was nurtured, I was cared for, I was given everything, and if I did something wrong, I had a whack across the face, I got screamed at, yelled at, or the clothes were stripped off, and she had my dad beat me with a leather belt, even to the point where neighbors were screaming, if that doesn't stop, we're going to call the cops. And this kind, and if I was perfect, everything was fine. She wanted perfect, I tried to be perfect. And that was the problem. I had to look good, I had to find out what was going on, I had to give them what they wanted, and I did. I tried to be the best little kid in the state of New Jersey. And unfortunately, I took that kind of relationship outside just for my parents, I, my teachers too. I wanted to please them. I did whatever I was told. It worked okay in education, you know. I sat there quietly. I did my work. I, I aced everything. I learned a lot. I had enjoyed school. It was great. Uh, I did that with everyone I met. What I was doing was soliciting their approval. I, w I would march to their drummer because as a, chi as a child, that was my weapon. That was my defense. If I got them to like me and approve of me and validate me, then they wouldn't explode and beat me up. So I became very good at that. So I had to find out what was going on, and then I could make the move. So you, you took the lead, whether you knew it or not, and then I could, I could take this, make the second move. And that's how I was with women. If I saw a little glimmer of green light, then I could proceed. But I didn't march in the margin on my own. When I was a, if I dated your teenage daughter, she was safe with me as long as she knew her, she had boundaries. And unfortunately, where I grew up, all of them had boundaries. And <laughs> so it took me, well, you know, I won't go into that. So, uh, and so when I met Sarah, uh, actually, I met her six months before I met her. I saw her in a movie. And she blew me away off the screen. I said, my God, what a great actor. That's wonderful. She's incredible. Wow. Six months later, I dropped my picture in a the theater somewhere. And they called me back. And I auditioned. And I got the part. And I got a small part in this play on Broadway for my very first job. And uh, I was understudying a Canadian actor named Bill Shatner. <laughs> and uh, when he was out for about a week, I went on. I got to appear on Broadway. My very first job. Anyway, I didn't know anything about Sarah. But she showed up on the, on the stage that day in the theater, and I heard that husky voice and that English accent, that sliding. <sighs> I was in love. Oh, man, but just unbelievable. I thought, but there's no hope here, because as I learned, she was up here in the theater. They were writing parts for her. She had already been nominated for Tony Awards, Drama Critic Awards. She won. Every hot guy on Broadway wanted her. Actors, writers, producers, wealthy guys. Guys six feet two, beautiful hunks, you know. And who was I? I was on the bottom of the totem pole. I was a first-generation American kid, working-class kid, blue-collar from Jersey City. No hope here. One day, Bill was working on a scene that Sarah wasn't in. And she asked, who, the stage man, who's the understudy? I'd like him to run lines with me. I got over there, and we started to run lines. And I finished running lines with her. And she said, my God, you're good. Uh-oh. <laughs> I got this from the goddess up there. And there were other perks, you know. Uh, as we kept rehearsing, rehearsing, I saw, I thought like a green light. Mm. <laughs> I moved in. It was all over. It was there. Uh, two pieces of wreckage on the high seas we came together. <laughs>
But now we were a little more buoyant because we were a larger volume. <laughs> and there were perks with her. It turns out she came from a theatrical family. Both her parents had stars on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, I went out with her. I, I met everybody I'd ever seen on television. I walked into Sardis with her on my arm, and I watched somebody. And that was the problem. All the normal things were there, the attractions, everything that was normal was there, and that was good. But this was abnormal. She did for me what I should have been able to do for myself. I should have been able to validate myself professionally and validate myself as a man. I should have known that, but I didn't have that self-confidence and that self-worth. I wasn't taught how to do that, brought up how to do that. I always had to get it from someone else. And so I got it from Sarah. And she became part of me and part of my identity. And so when her alcoholism kicked in, I had to do something about it because that was me. The identity, you know, in its own way, it's a little sick. You know, I mean, I know a lot of couples like that. I see them go through life. You can't tell them apart after a while. And you never see them separated. And when one person dies, the other one's dead within three weeks or three months because a half a person doesn't stay alive. But with us, we gave away our own personal selves to this unity. And it's wrong. Psychologically, it's not the best. And so I went ahead and did all the wrong things because of this. And I didn't learn about it until I got into Al-Anon and she got into rehab and I had this psychologist. And she suggested that perhaps I continue with the program and go on to the second half of step one, get a sponsor and do the rest of the steps. She said the therapy will do you some good. And I bought into it. And so I found a sponsor. And uh, he began to work with me right away. He, first thing he said to me, he said, Carl, wherever you shave on that mirror, put a little sign. You are looking at the problem. I said, okay. okay. <laughs> And I did that. And he said, and get a uh, 12 by 12 and start working on the first step. I said, first step. He said, you know, Richard, I've got to tell you, I'm really panicked about the fourth and the fifth. I don't, know. I don't know how I'm going to do that. He says, I have a solution for you to get over the panic. You focus on step one. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. This was a simple man. I'm complicated. He brought me down to earth. You see, when I first heard things like uh, first things first, stay in the moment to do the next indicated step, I thought, what about that? Yeah, it's stupid uh, slogans these people have. It's crazy. I like something more complicated. You know, you go to the guru and you say to him, what is the secret to a happy life? And he says, ah, uh, did you have breakfast this morning? Yes. Then wash your bowl. Oh, wow. That's deep. I get that. Yeah, man. What does it mean? It means first things first, stay in the moment, do the next indicated step. You know. So I found the right guy to be my sponsor. And he said to me, he said, Carl, you're probably your own worst enemy. I said, no, my first wife is still alive. <laughs> he said, ah, we're going to have fun doing steps. And we did. And by the time I got through steps four and five, I felt different. I asked myself the question one day, what kind of people will do a searching and fearless moral inventory? of themselves and share it with another human being. You know what the answer is? People like us, decent people who are trying to become better people. And for the first time in my life, I didn't need someone to tell me that I was a decent person trying to become a better one. And the way down deep, there was a sense of self-worth and self-respect developing on my own. And the further I went through the steps, the better it got. I got into the uh, amends steps. My sponsor said, amends to your mother and your father, because they weren't on the list. And I said, oh, come on, Richard. He said, look, I've got you forgiving yourself about your nasty behavior years ago. You're going to have to forgive your mother for the same and your dad. He said, make a list of all the good things they've done for you, all the good things you got from them, all the great roles and models that they were to you, and ignore the bad stuff. But make that list of good qualities that you got from them and the gifts you got. And then you'll be able to let go. I said, okay. And he said, go into their lives, figure out who they are. And I did. They were wonderful people. Wonderful people. My dad was, uh, was from uh, Germany, and uh, he was in the German Merchant Marine. And in, in the 1920s, he, he, he got his first trip. He was about, probably about 20, 21 years old. In 1927, I think he got to uh, New York. And he had shore leave, and he went. To, uh, he spent a lot of it uh, in a German-Jewish delicatessen on the west side. And he had a great time with these people. And when his ship left, they left without him. And he had a job in the deli, a room above the deli, and he learned to make the greatest potato salad in the world. And as he learned English, he also learned Yiddish. Why was that a gift to me? Well, think about World War II. I had German relatives over there. Germany was raging anti-Semitic. My household was completely free of anti-Semitism. He had a Jewish partner in business. I was never given the baggage of that kind of bigotry. Yes, it was a gift. 
and a gift of humor from my dad. The way he played with our language, the way Victor Borger would. He had a cunning little sense of humor that I loved. He'd point out things that I could have seen, but I wouldn't have. You're riding along the highway, and there's a sign, eat here, get gas. (laughs) Or uh, if you think your waiter is rude, you should see the manager. And it made me aware of those things, you know. And, and, and in the last 10 years, I've been writing articles, you know, based on all stuff like this and getting them published. And it's only because my dad got me interested in things like that that I went ahead and all my life was interested in our language, you know. And, and his humor was generally wasn't hostile. You know, he loved stuff like, uh, have you lived here all your life? Uh, well, no, not yet. <laughs> it's sweet. Come on. You know, but this is the sort of thing he passed on to me. So I made my amends to him, and I, I, he was dead, and I wrote him a letter, and I said, Dear Pop, thank you for all these gifts. I love you very much. You've been great. And uh, I burned the letter over the place where I had uh, buried his ashes. And for my mother, uh, she, I've got to tell you about sense of honesty. Come on. Uh, they borrowed money from a very wealthy lady uh, back then. Uh, today it would be the equivalent of $5,000 with no paperwork. That woman trusted my parents. Two months later, she died. And I heard my mother, they got word and a letter, and I heard my mother say to my dad, Mrs. Burns has died. We've got to find out who's handling the estate so we know where to pay back the money. They could have walked. Is that a gift? You bet it's a gift. She used to read German to me, the old script, and teach me how to read. That helped me a lot. I lived in Europe for a while. Hey, I had a great time in all countries, and uh, it was a gift. I didn't mind foreigners so much. I became near fluent in German. Every time I go to Germany, I learn more. I speak it without an accent, like a native, not fluent, but pretty good gift. She told me stories about the goats she used to tend after school. They had names. They were characters. They were delightful little stories, super little stories. And she was charming in her way. And I forgave her. And I made my amends indirectly. I treated her differently. I became a loving son instead of one who was a little standoffish. And I no longer resented her, which is the beautiful thing. Because Richard, my sponsor, pointed out that I had a part in all of that. And I, I didn't understand that. He said, the part you, you had in that, I said, I was the victim. He says, yes, but you are still the victim. That's your part in it. You keep holding on to it. That's why you're making amends to these people, so that you can let go of it. And this is a very selfish program. But my mother's relationship with me, we were just doing great. We were fabulous. And I remember... Uh, some months later, that I, I realized I was driving down the freeway and some guy cut me off into some strange thing. And I said, that this has been about three months and I haven't gone ballistic out here. And without my trying, I found that my driving finger had been retired. <laughs> and that's because I think all that anger was gone. You know, and I had let go of it and I was getting along beautifully with my mother. And, you know, and I found out also I was the kind of person who looked for trouble. I mean, I like to find people doing stuff wrong because, you know, I, I could put them down. I could feel superior to them. I put them down and made me put me one up. And I, I reminded myself, did I catch them doing something wrong? Yeah, that was great. I loved that. I reminded myself of the lady who lives in the high rise in the big city. She calls the cops and she says, I want you to send someone over because there's a guy across the way and he stands in the window and he's there now and he has no clothes on. I don't want to tell you what he's doing. It's very upsetting. You should come. He's like, calm down, lady. We'll send a cop. The cop comes over, knocks on the door. She says, come in. Is he there now? Yeah. He says, well, right out that window. And he, okay, where? She says, you know, the, the, across the way, the window in the corner, the top right-hand corner. The cop looks out the window. He says, I don't see anybody there. She says, where are you looking? She says, he says, next door. She says, no, 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 look across the roof and that, that other building sticking up over there. Oh, that one, yeah, the right-hand corner. Yeah. Yeah, I see a guy standing there. Yeah, he probably doesn't have any clothes on, but I don't really see down to, a, to about, you know, mid-chest or something. She says, the chair, the chair, stand on the chair. <laughs> All my life I've been standing on a chair. Now I could give it up. We were talking one night, and I remarked about my kid brother, who is 14 years younger than I. And he, they never had him. You see, they became much better parents right around age 12, 14. I, I don't know why. But, and I never gave them credit for that, and I should have. And that was part of my making amends. But I mentioned to my mom, I said, you know, you have a real nice son living in Rhode Island. And she said, I have a lovely son living in California. I said, thank you. And she said, why I have that in my life, I have no idea. Because of the terrible way I treated you. When you were a little boy, and I was such an angry young woman. In a flash, I realized a couple of things. All her life, 
she had felt guilty. And that's why she was so needy and demanding of me to write, 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 stay in touch, stay in touch. She needed to be reassured. She'd been feeling that guilt all her life. And it also, in a flash, I realized that she validated my perception of my childhood. I was not crazy. It was like I remembered it. But now, because of my sponsor in this program, I was able to say to this woman, Mom, I've forgotten about all of that. What I remember are all these wonderful things I got from you and Dad. And I had the list, and I could start talking about it and tell her about the goats, about this, about her honesty. And you had two human beings on either end of the phone weeping. And I was free, and she was free. She was 82 years old when she made her amends to me. And she did it without a program. She was one hell of a woman. She died two years ago. She was almost 99. And she was free of guilt all that time. Courtesy of the miracle of this program, I changed my attitude a little bit and it opened the door for her to open her feelings to me. I changed my attitude a little bit and the world around me changes. I am the problem. I almost did not forgive her for the man she married three years after my dad died. Not because she married, but whom she married. I didn't like the guy. He was a right wing. He was a retired New York cop. We knew him, and he was a control freak. I didn't realize how bad he was. But my mother was in her needy mood by the time she was marrying this guy, and I figured he'd take her off my hands. With all the things screaming and hollering about not calling enough, doing this enough, he'd take her off my hands. Wrong. He was the worst Alan on case, head case I've ever known. <laughs> I heard him utter this sentence. Listen to this sickness. I live only for your mother's happiness. <laughs> what a dog he was. <laughs> and instead of becoming her husband, what he did, he decided he was my father. And I was a seven-year-old off at camp, and I needed lessons to write my mother and do this. And I'd get these lectures written to me, and I'd, tear them. I'd read one sentence and tear them up. And if I was cool to my mother, I was, I was pa passive-aggressive to him. That's the way to put it. I was a piece of work. If he said something funny, I was the one person who didn't laugh. You know, he got nothing from me. And it went on like that. He really annoyed me. And one day, I, found a, I got a piece of gossip on him, something that... Was it, it would have embarrassed him because he knew everything. And he was one of those. He wouldn't have liked it if I had known. And he certainly would have been embarrassed if my mother had known. And I thought, you so-and-so, he did a pull a couple of stunts. I wouldn't even go into them. I said, if, you get, if he gets up my nose one more time, I'm going to get on that phone. And I'm going to say, what were you doing? And I'm going to spill this stuff. It, you know, uh, I was going to blackmail him. And he would have shut up and never done, never gotten on my case again. I was all set for him. Oh, I was a piece of work. And then he gave me the excuse. I picked up my voicemail one night and I heard, because I hadn't written, I was five minutes late with a letter or something. He was ballistic. If my mother went a little crazy, he went twice as crazy because she was crazy. Here was the message. Strangled anger. Call your mother, you son of a bitch. And, my, oh, and I said, ah, I've got this bit of information I'm going to just unload on you. And I picked up the phone and dialed it. And he always answered the control freak. <laughs> And he did, and I said, ah. And the words wouldn't come out. You see what happened? I've been in the program too long. It was wrong. It was wrong. What I was about to do was wrong. I didn't have to go to a law book and figure it out. There wasn't a statute that said, you don't do this because, and there's a $500 fine. No. The program says, you do what is right because it is right, and you don't do what is wrong because you know what is wrong. So I, talk, I said, let me talk to my mother. So I talked to her. I got off the phone, and I was angry, really angry, because I wanted revenge. Nobody talks to me like that. And how dare he? How dare he take over the role of my father? Who does he think he is? Uh, anger, anger, anger. I couldn't sleep. Didn't sleep. I lost sleep a day after day after day. And I bored people at meetings. I bored my sponsor. I bored my wife with all this stuff. I wouldn't let go. And finally, Sarah said to me one day, she said, you know, we're all getting a little bit sick of this. She said, I want you to go into the, to the world's smallest study, we call it, and use my God box. I said, come on, Sarah, you know, I'm a little uh, funny about God sometimes. She said, use the God box. <laughs> so I went and I picked up a piece of paper and I wrote down, dear God, if you are indeed there, please relieve me of my obsession with this son of a bitch, Herman. <laughs> and I folded it up and I put it into the God box. I walked over into the living room, over to the sofa, and I sat down, and I waited. And I waited. 
couple of minutes later, it felt as if I were taking by the hand and light up the mountain, and there's the guru. And I said, and he says, stop whining. You know the answer, it's in your program. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I did. I treated the man badly for I don't know how many years. I owe an apology for that. I had to change that. I had no right to treat him that way. I don't care. Whatever he's doing to me, I had no right to be disrespectful to him. I could have been much nicer. It wouldn't have hurt at all. I should apologize to him and change my ways. And the other thing was something I owed myself, that al don't necessarily set boundaries very well. And I didn't. I let people walk all over me. I respected everyone else's boundaries, but I had none of my own. It was time to tell him what I should have told him in the first place. Herman, you married my mother, and that's fine, but you're not my dad. End of story. If my mother and I have problems, we'll have to work them out. If you get in there, they'll only get worse. Now, he wouldn't like that information, but I'd have to give it to him in the best loving possible way. And I did, and I wrote the best letter I could have come up with, and I kept it and kept it, reviewed, finally sent it, and I gave it 10 days. And if I didn't hear, I was going to call. And I didn't hear. So uh, I called. Now, I knew he was going to answer, because he always did. And I always said, it's Carl, let me talk to my mother. So I can start a little differently this time. And I'm going to tell you one thing about him. Every time I called, he would then get my mother, walk out of the room, go around, pick up the extension somewhere, and listen in without saying anything. <laughs> you know? Now, I know it's a little picky on me to, 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 to mention all that, but, but I want you guys on my side in this story. <laughs> <laughs> So I dial, and he answers, and I say, it's Carl from California. How are you, Herman? He says, Go ahead, Carl, hey, I say, yeah, I'm fine. I say, so what's going on? He starts telling me about a horseshoe league he's starting for senior citizens, things like that. And I say, oh, that's great. You know, we have a conversation about five minutes. Never mentions the letter. But hey, we're having a conversation like we never had before. This is terrific. He gets my mother. I hear him go around. He picks up the phone. I don't care. Well, I talk with my mother. have a great conversation. She doesn't mention the letter. But I know, because everything's different. It's all so great. And so I finally hang up, and I said, Sarah, did you hear that conversation? She says, yeah. I said, they never mentioned the letter, but it's great. It's all work. And I went back to meetings, and I said, guys, thanks for everything, for listening, but it's all worked out. I used the God box. I set boundaries. I wrote the letter. It's, they never mentioned but it's unbelievable. We have the relationship. It's changed completely. And I wondered one day, would they ever mention the letter? And yeah, one day, my mother did. And it was interesting, it was about three months later, she mentioned it in a letter where she said, um, you know, I read the letter to Herman, and I'm sorry, you know, it was written only to him, but he brings the mail up, puts it on my desk, and I opened it up, and I started to read it, and then she said I couldn't stop. And she said, I want to tell you, it's, it's a very good letter, and I'm very proud of you. And she said, but now since the two of you are getting along so well, do you really think I should still give it to him? <laughs> You are looking at my problem. <laughs> what happened? I changed my attitude this much when he answered the phone. Instead of saying, it's Carl, let me talk to him. He said, hi, Herman. How are you? What are you doing? How are things? That's all. I changed that little bit, and this fascist became a human being. <laughs> you see, I change myself, and the world around me changes. Another miracle of the program. About 13 years ago, uh, I woke up, and it was a rude awakening for me. Uh, fortunately, there was a spiritual awakening that followed later that day. I read an article in the newspapers about uh, civilian heroes of World War II, people I really adored, and I thought I respected them so much. And I thought I would be like them. These are the people who saved the Jews from the Nazis in the concentration camps. They stuck their necks out to save people they didn't even know. They were incredible, all over the country, all over Europe, every country. There was even a Japanese ambassador to Germany who wrote exit visas for 4,000 Jews, and they took the Trans-Siberian Railway, and they, this Jewish colony spent the entire World War II in Japan. He was, he was like Oscar Schindler. He was a German guy whom I identified with when I saw the picture. I thought, yeah, if I'd been born, my parents had been in Germany and I'd been born there, I'd have been Schindler. That's who I would have been. It was part of my, my self-image. And just to make it worse, my family name is the German word for hero. And I thought of myself as a little kid, hero. That's part of my self-image. And now I was reading about these people. And I would have done what they did. 
why did you do what you did? They were asked by the psychologists, and they also gave the same answer. They said, we did it because it was right, period. Just because it was right, for no other reason. And the psychologists wanted to know what else they had in common, that they would all behave in the same way in these circumstances. And they finally found it. It was the way they were parented. They were brought up with what the psychologists call love and discipline. We call it unconditional love. And the example they gave is this. Little Johnny's playing in the park, and he's got his father and mother with him. And he's playing in the sand, and next to him is little Timmy who wants to borrow one of his toys. And he says, no, I don't want and the parents said, oh, go ahead, lend, lend your little toys to uh, Timmy. He said, because that way you know, he'll, I don't want to, look, if you lend your toys to him, he'll lend your, his toys to you, and you'll have that many more to choose from. He said, we do it because it's convenient. It's not, it is the right thing to do, and that's why we do it. He said, no, I don't want to. Why don't you want to? I don't know. Oh, sure, you must have a reason. Well, I don't feel like it. Oh, I understand. Well, maybe you're not old enough to learn this lesson yet, but let's see. Here's what we'll do. You know, Uncle Charlie's coming over on Saturday for dinner. Oh, wow, yes, and I know you like to sit next to him. And this week he's going to be doing magic tricks at the end of the table, and you'll want to be right there and see them. Yes. Now, if you share your toys with little Timmy, then you get to sit next to Uncle Charlie. And if you don't want to share your toys with little Timmy, okay, but then you sit at the other end of the table. So that day, little, Timmy, little Johnny learns to share his toys or not, but that is the way in which he learns it. That is love and discipline. He never doubted that his parent loved him. It was never withdrawn. His parents showed respect for his feelings. His parent gave him power over his own life. Love was not the bargaining ship. That's unconditional love. That is love and discipline. Little Carl learned it a different way. What do you mean you don't want to share your toys? You don't want to share your toys? You share your toys? Why? I don't feel like your feelings don't count. I remember that sentence ringing in my ears. It's never left my brain. Your feelings don't count. But you share your toys or else, whack. And little Carl learned to share his toys that day, whether he was ready to learn it or not. And that's how I learned. I was treated like a laboratory rat. And the path of righteousness that runs through the maze, I learned how to go through it. If I went through the right exit, what a good boy. I go through the wrong exit, whack. By the time I come out the other end, I'm standing there, and I know right from wrong. And I can stand next to little Johnny where he had love was never withdrawn with me. It was withdrawn, withdrawn with every whack. And society could look at the two of us and say, what two lovely young men. How nice they are. So aware of other people. So polite. They obey the law. What terrific guys they are. But what a difference between us. I did what was right because I was afraid not to. I did what was right because I was told to. Because I learned how to follow instructions and follow orders and obey orders and obey orders and obey orders, like the soldiers at My Lai in Vietnam. When Lieutenant Kelly came upon the village with his squad and the early women and children there, he said, they're aiding and abetting the Viet Cong, kill them. And they did. And I read about that years earlier, and I said, what is the matter with these people? Why can't they question orders like that? Hadn't they ever heard of Nazi Germany? We were only following orders. That's terrible. I was superior to these people. I was way different, way better. Who were these horrible people? And on that day, 13 years ago, I suddenly saw their humanity. It was mine. I was capable of that. And I could only be grateful that when I was in the Korean War, I was never asked to do something like that, because the odds are that I would have obeyed orders. And I would have deserved exactly the punishment that they got. And I was destroyed. My self-image was destroyed. I was a fraud as a man, fraud as a human being. And I didn't know what to do. My sponsor was out of town. I found a meeting. It was a Thursday night. And I got there. It was a small meeting, 20 guys. We now have 120 there. I found one guy I knew. And I poured my heart and soul out to him at the break. And he put his arm around me. He said, Carl, when we work our program, we become better people. And I relaxed. I said, yeah, Willie, yeah. And that night at home, I lay in bed. And I thought, I've been in this program for nearly 10 years. I'm not what I was before. Hey, I know what this program is all about. And I'll quote Jack C. from last year, a good buddy of mine. He said, this program is a program of forgiveness and second chances where we do, don't shoot our wounded. And I come in here wounded, and this program gathers me up like a little child, like a nurturing parent, and says, we love you in a very special way. Here, this is what we did to heal ourselves. And for the first time in my life, I get what I always needed, a good listening to. And my voice was heard for the first time, and my feelings were heard. And people said, we love you. And I got hugs. And I felt like I belonged. And the program wasn't rammed down my throat. And I realized 
and the program is about forgiveness. I got forgiven. I get to forgive. I get to forgive my parents. And all parents need forgiveness, and that includes me. And I got that from my stepson and my daughter because I made my amends to them. And this program then, as it turns out, is a program of growing up. The program has become my parent. And it's like little Johnny's parents. It's love and discipline. I'm not yelled at, screamed at. I don't have to do this by Tuesday. No one's going to beat me up or scream at me. I get, I get to be a human being. I can fall on my can, and I'll be picked up. And someone will hug me and say, I love you. I get to do this when I'm ready to do it. I'm encouraged, just gently encouraged to do what is right because it is right. So that eventually I learned how to share my toys and sit with Uncle Charlie, where the magic is. The magic of serenity and happiness, peace and contentment, whether the alcohol is drinking or not or whatever. I learned slowly to do what is right because it is right. This program has gotten me to do things that I never would have done. My church did not get me to obey the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. This program did and the grace of my higher power, and this program did. Because of this program, I have learned that this is an inside job. I have to feel self-respect and self-worth from within. I can't get it from you or from anybody else. I do not, do not have to worry about my image. I am supposed to work on my substance, and the image will take care of itself. It's as simple as that. And my wife is in my life today because I want her in my life, and she wants me in her life. We're not, I'm, she's not in my life because I need her. That neurotic need is gone, long gone. My life is a cake, and my wife is the icing. I, I'm going to stop that analogy right there. <laughs> Just as I inherited characteristics from my parents, so will I hope inherit the characteristics of this program. It is his own perfect example of how to behave. There is nothing negative about this program. Have you ever seen anything as humble as this program? There are people, religious philosophies out there who know all the answers and will tell you all the answers for all people at all times and all circumstances, and this program does not tell you answer one. It says, if you put your own house in order, the answers will come. You and I may have the same problem. You'll find your answer, I'll find my answer, and they'll both be right. This program is flexible. I have to learn to be flexible. It doesn't tell me what to do. I shouldn't tell my sponsees what to do. I tell them what I did. Oh, I might stretch your point and say, well, if I were you, I would think about doing such and such. But you're you and I'm me. That's about as far as I'll ever go. Love and discipline. What it accomplishes is wonderful. This is an incredible program for living. And you think about it, at my age, I do. It's an incredible program for dying. You do it the same way. It's life on life's terms. Acceptance, day at a time. I used to think I was, you know, the exception. Now I know differently. <laughs> And that's it. But the other characteristic of the program is kind, loving, and gentle. Then I have to be kind, loving, and gentle, too. And if all these characteristics come into me and become part of me, who I am, then I will have climbed the mountain. But I'm a human being. And this program is not about the destination. It is all about the journey. And we're all on that same journey up that mountain. Different paths, sometimes the same paths, sometimes our paths cross. They cross today. I love this program. And I love program people. I'm so grateful to have been asked to speak here today. Thank you again. I leave you with one, one wish for you. As I do with mine, may you and your higher power walk hand in hand 